Hello, friends. Welcome to Clarendon United Methodist Church. Thank you so much for worshiping with us today. If you're streaming service from home, we're thrilled that you're here. Please take a moment to find the links in the description box. There, you'll find a way to mark your attendance, follow along with the service bulletin, and a link to our website where you can see what's going on in the life of the church, as well as where to give your tithes and offerings online. Following the service, our pastors Tracy and Nilsi will be at the church doors to meet and greet with you. Also, after the service, please join us downstairs in Quarry Hall for some refreshments and good conversation. We want to connect with you. It's a great day in church. Let's invite God's spirit as we worship.
Good morning, friends. Welcome to the house of God, a place where we call home. Now take a deep breath and leave all your worries in the hands of Jesus. We welcome our online community. It's so nice to see you chiming in the chat during the service. Remember, you have to log in in order to post a comment. Now take a look at the video description to find our order of worship, the giving link, and more information about our service. Welcome to all of you joining us in this beautiful sanctuary. We are happy to see you. Please find the red attendance pad, write your name on it, and pass it down to your neighbor. If you are a first-time guest, we are so honored that you are worshiping with us today. Please join us for refreshments at the end of the service downstairs. Speaking of the coffee hour, our SPRC is asking everybody to come downstairs today to write a short note of inspiration to our amazing staff for an upcoming special event. I want to call your attention to our announcements. On October 29th, we, we will have our bazaar. This event is open to our community, so we invite you to come shop, but also to come and greet our neighbors and friends who perhaps will be coming to our church for the first time. So that's coming up October 29th. Now, on Halloween night, we will have a trunk or treat in our parking lot. So we are asking you to bring your car, park on the side parking lot, put some decorations around it and hand out candy to our little neighbors who are counting down the days to go trick-or-treating. If you normally stay home to hand out candy, you can divide and conquer. One person can hand out candy here and one person can stay home. This event is from 6 to 8 p.m. If you're able to make it, please let me know or fill out the quick form just to let us know that you are coming and bringing your truck your trunk. We, are, we have a beautiful service planned for today. Our pastor will be preaching on the posture of prayer. The children will sing. Oh, it's a great day to be in God's house. Please stand for the greeting. Welcome. Welcome into God's presence. God loves us and calls us. God speaks and we are changed. Let us open our hearts and minds to God's word.
Let us pray. God of patient love, we confess that we often lose heart and forget to pray. Speak to us today through the music, through the scripture, and through one another, encouraging us to reach out to you and to trust you. Amen. Please be seated. are you guys doing? Good. Good. Okay. So today in our scripture, we have a story about a woman who is persistent. Does anyone know what persistent means? No. No. Yeah, it's a harder word. I get that. Yeah. You want to try? You keep going. You keep going even if it's hard. Yes. When things are difficult, you keep going. Yeah, I'm in the middle of a children's message. Okay. Again. Uh, okay, how about you just come up here? I think Aaron probably needs to learn how to tie his shoe. No, fine. We've been over this. This is hard, and I would rather you tie it. Who knows how to tie their shoe? I don't okay, come on up, Aaron. I think it's time for Aaron to learn how to tie his shoe himself. What do you guys think? Yeah. Yeah. He's a yeah. Grown up. He, should he is a grown up. Okay. Does anyone have any suggestions for tying shoes? Yes. Um, so you make an X go under. Make the X go under. Okay, other tips? Yes. And then you loop the other one. You loop the other one under. Like awesome. Like this. Okay. Any other suggestions? Yeah. 
do double knot. Oh. I can't even do a single knot. I know how to do it. Do okay. <laughs> and then you make a loop. Are you make a loop. Like okay. This. Yeah. It is hard to tie your shoe. And then you make another loop. Awesome. Awesome. Oh, well, I did that one. I can't. I just can't. No, don't give up. Don't, don't give up. Keep okay. going. Keep trying. You almost got it. Okay, on the count of three, we're going to say, you got it, Aaron. One, two, three. You got it, Aaron. He did it. Oh, wow. Okay, claps for Aaron. Good job, Aaron. Yeah. Okay. So, even though tying your shoes, maybe riding a bicycle, what else is hard? Learning how to spell. There's so many things that are hard. Wow, you're the only one I know. Spelling's hard for me. Yes. Like, Naya. It's the easiest word to spell. Wow. One thing yeah. um, that's really hard to learn is how to swim. Swimming is really hard to learn. No, You're right. Yes, so everyone, I think everyone has different things. I know how to swim. I know how to swim. Okay, here's the thing, guys. We're going to stay quiet really quick, okay? Because I, I do have a story here. Okay. Sometimes things are really hard, and it can be hard for different people at different stages or ages in life. But in their story today, there's a woman who has to go to a judge, and she needs him to do something because she was wrong. And she keeps going, and she's like, I need help, I need help. And he says, no, not really interested in helping. And finally, she asks so many times that he says, okay, I'm going to help you. And even though he's not super nice about it, the point of the story is she never gives up. She keeps asking until she gets what she needs, which is justice. She's very persistent. And the part of this that's most important is Jesus tells his disciples a story to help them never give up, especially when it comes to prayer. Because sometimes when we pray, things don't happen the way we think it's going to or doesn't happen right away. And the point is to never lose heart because God is always listening to our prayers, even if we don't know how, what, when, where, why. So persistence in all things is a really important lesson. Okay? So never give up. We're going to do a little prayer. Okay. Want to repeat after me? Okay. Ready? Dear Jesus. Thank you for helping us. Never give up. And thank you for never giving up on us. Amen. Thank you. A reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. Then Jesus told them a parable about their need to pray always and not to lose heart. He said, in a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor had respect for people. In that city, there was a widow who kept coming to him and saying, Grant me justice against my accuser. For a while he refused, but later he said to himself, Though I have no fear of God, and no respect for anyone. Yet, because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice so that she may not wear me out by continually coming. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God grant justice to his chosen ones? who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long in helping them? I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them. And yet, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. How do you like to pray? Do you like to pray sitting in a pew or sitting in a comfy chair at home? Do you choose to pray laying down? Maybe first thing in the morning before you look at your phone, people say that looking at the phone is the first thing they do. Well, maybe you pray right before that. Start your day in prayer. Or maybe it's the last thing you do lying there in bed but as you lay you yourself down to go to sleep, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord, my soul to keep. Or 
Do you pray most effectively when you're sitting in traffic with your hands gripped on the steering wheel, muttering your prayers under your breath? What is your posture of prayer? That is the topic for today, sort of. Because we're dealing with a parable of Jesus and we're dealing with a gospel writer who takes that parable and embeds it in his story of the life and death and resurrection of Jesus and by doing so seeks to teach the lessons through Jesus' voice that Jesus taught. So we're dealing with Jesus and his parable that was passed down that was being circulated around the early church, and we're dealing with the gospel writer, Luke, who is the only one who actually uses this parable of Jesus among the gospel writers. We're dealing with Luke, who takes it and fits it into a particular spot in his gospel for a particular purpose, as we can imagine. I've really enjoyed this week delving into a bunch of commentaries because I don't know, when you read or heard this text, did you start kind of scratching your head? (laughs) What, What exactly is the connection between this unjust judge, this corrupt judge, and this this widow who is so persistent, so fired up, so so harassing? What, what's the, diff, the connection between these two characters, neither of them particularly likable, and the power of persistence in prayer, never giving up, holding on to your faith, remaining steadfast. It's a little bit difficult, but you're dealing in, in this interpretation with two different tellers of the story, Jesus and Luke. So, so I read a lot of commentaries this week. It's not surprising. And I think my favorite, which is not uncommon, is the, wor- the words I found from Amy Jill Levine. Now, some of you are in the Morning Glories Women's Bible Study, and so you know Amy Jill Levine. You've seen her videos and, and enjoyed Bible study, I think even more than once with her. I think several times you've chosen to return to Amy Jill Levine, uh, a Jewish biblical scholar who actually doesn't study the Old Testament but studies the New Testament because she so admires the teachings of Jesus. She so admires the Gospels and the New Testament overall. And so she is one of our primary voices in the church today helping us to understand the connection between the Gospels, the New Testament, and the Old Testament, or, or more than that, between the Gospels and their context in first century Judaism. The context of Jesus' life and death and resurrection, his teaching and ministry in that first century Jewish context, because of course, Jesus was Jewish. And so that's embedded, all of our teachings are embedded in that narrative, that context, that experience of life. And so Levine is a great person to to interact with as we hear the Jewish context and her take on, on some of the background of what was going on in the stories. And she says there are a couple of possible interpretations. One of them is the interpretation of Luke the evangelist, who tells the parable about praying always and not losing heart. So he puts it in the story that he's telling of Jesus' life and death and resurrection. He puts it in a spot where it fits just right to be saying, you need to always persist in prayer. Because Luke was was sharing his gospel at a particular time in the life of the early church. A time when there was a, a tremendous struggle when the the temple had fallen, when things were not easy. This was decades after Jesus' death and resurrection, and, and things had happened in the meantime. And folks were saying, well, I thought Jesus was going to be coming immediately, a second coming of Jesus right away, and we're, we've been waiting, and now things are in turmoil, and we're under oppression, under Roman rule. 
Things are hard, and, and Luke was concerned. All the gospel writers, indeed, were concerned that people would lose heart, would lose confidence in God, would stop their praying, stop their persistence in faith. He was concerned, and so some of his reason for writing the gospel, for sharing this vital story of who Jesus is and what he taught and how God worked and continued to work through Jesus, part of his reason for sharing it was to encourage everyone to help them remain persistent in prayer. So he pulls this, this parable of Jesus and sticks it in just the right spot in his gospel to, to say, remain strong in your faith, hold on, and, and keep on until the, the end of time, which is going to be here before you know it. it. It's already affecting us now. So there's Luke's telling of the story with this clear, easy message, remain persistent, remain faithful in prayer, do not lose heart. But when you take away Luke's framework and you dig into the parable right into the heart of it and you look at the words of Jesus, the parable itself, not the interpretation, it's a lot harder to understand where Jesus was coming from. Was this really the whole of the parable? Was there maybe more that Jesus said to help us understand why we should want to spend any time with these two unsympathetic characters? The, well, persistent is a, a nice word for her, the persistent widow. She apparently got a hold of the, the judge's phone number and left voicemail after voicemail after voicemail, texted incessantly, showed up at the doorstep, showed up at the, the court chambers, would not let it go. Give me what I want. And now, the New Revised Standard Version and, and most other versions in English translate this parable very nicely. They say that she was asking for justice, which is a good thing, of course. But if you look at the original language, it's really saying, I want to be avenged. I want my vengeance. Ah, well, that's not such a pretty picture of this widow. Vengeance isn't something we're supposed to really want to get with our morality today. And also, in that part in the, the text where the judge says, you know what, I'm just going to give in because she's going to wear me out. Oh no, that's not what the original text says. The original word is one that comes out of the boxing world. What it means is, if I don't give in to her demands, she's going to give me a black eye. She's going to hit me in the face. I'm going to get something I'm not bargaining for. I'm just going to give in. So the judge seems to be able to be co-opted, able to, to be corrupted perhaps, just through expediency. I just don't want this bad effect to ha happen, and so I'm going to give in to what the woman says. This is what Jesus gives us to work with in the parable, a, a persistent difficult widow and a judge who changes his mind not because he cares about God or about other people he's made that clear quite specifically but just because it's expedient <laughs> I just don't want this woman to attack me I don't want a black eye it's a, a hard parable to deal with so I, I spent a lot of time in commentaries this week. Trying to hear the parables of Jesus is what Levine, uh, Amy Jill Levine says, is an act of historical imagination. Trying to think back to what Jesus said, to take anything we can get of what Jesus said, and then imagine what he was trying to say to us. Luke takes one approach. We're given this text embedded in Luke's narrative, and we can do some of that work ourselves as well. What was Jesus up to? Sometimes it seems like Luke is really just trying to help us to domesticate 
this parable, to tame it down. Because that's what the parables are. They are wild and untamed. They are difficult to deal with. Just when you think you understand a really nice, clear, straightforward, indeed helpful message from a parable, you're probably in the process of domesticating it. Because Jesus wasn't trying to give us something nice and easy and tame. He was trying to turn us upside down. That's what the, the use of the parable is all about. Again and again, these parables are, are things that challenge our stereotypes, that push us beyond our expectations, that sometimes take us into territory that we feel very uncomfortable with, like this one. What is the morality of this story? So Luke, benevolent though it was, was trying to help us and trying to help himself by telling a larger story. Be persistent. Don't lose heart. Yeah, the second coming hasn't happened quite yet, but God is still faithful. Be like this widow. Keep on going. Make your posture, posture of prayer one of action. Amy Jill Levine says, Sometimes when Luke does something like that, he takes away a bit of the genius of Jesus' teaching. But it's not uncommon. Don't we all do that? Don't we all try to tame down the parables to make them easy to understand? We really like a nice clear-cut point. We'd like it if Jesus would take a parable and wrap it in a beautiful package and put a lovely bow on top and hand it to us so that we could unwrap this gift of something that's going to give us a good nugget of truth, something to kind of take home from, with us from church. But instead, Jesus comes in here and just riles things up messes with us, turns things upside down. So, so Luke is behaving benevolently in trying to tame it all. And he's frankly doing what we want him to do anyway. But there is value in trying to step beyond the interpreter, beyond Luke, and spending time with Jesus in the text to remove it from its gift wrap to try to see how the first century hearers would have received it. So Luke provides this narrative about praying always and not losing heart, and it doesn't quite match. The parable itself pushes us into a multitude of questions, pushes us into a territory that's not comfortable at all. What what is the role of a courtroom and how justice is run? Is there a place for vengeance as well as the pure form of justice, meaning that which is good for all, that which is right and true? We end up with questions about what kind of judges we want in a courtroom sitting up there on the bench, about what we expect of judges and of justice. It stirs up questions about the role of women. This Palestinian widow, Luke very often tries to tame widows and just uh, see them as those who are vulnerable and quiet and meek when we see throughout the Old and New Testaments that widows are a force to be reckoned with in the first century and throughout that time. What is the role of women in the courtroom or in the, the community, in the culture, the parable starts stirring up questions in us. And Luke, bless his heart, tries to tame them. It doesn't mean that he's right or wrong, because there's also another truth embedded in all of this, that God is giving us two messages in this text. The gift in this story is both Luke's call to persistence and not losing heart in our faith in times when, that are dark and difficult. That is actually a gift God gives us in this text. But then God also gives us this nugget from Jesus, this parable that's meant to get us going, to turn us over. 
So it's one of the things I appreciated most from what Levine was teaching on this text. She wrote like 40 pages on it, <laughs> a lot. On the, and then, then produced a video about it as well, that 10 minute video. One thing I really liked about what she was saying is that in Judaism, study, the interpretation of Torah, of, of the word of God, indeed community discussion on God's word is itself a form of worship. So if we look at Jesus as a first century Jew, she says, or if we were to read this text like Jews, reading this text and seeking its multiple meanings, seeing how it works on us, how it inspires and frustrates us or forces us to ask new questions, that is itself a form of worship. It's a form of communicating with the storyteller, with the synagogue, with the community around. In Judaism, it's understood that this wrestling with the text is a form of worship. No, no wonder Jesus chooses the parable as a key method of teaching. He's giving this gift to people to worship as they wrestle with the word of God, as they wrestle with the text, not just coming in and saying, what lovely nugget can I go home with? But instead saying, how is God pushing and prodding me today? If we are left with deep questions about our values and how they should be lived out, Levine says that too is an act of worship. Jesus doesn't just come in and offer us a tidy list of do's and don'ts. Do this and you will live. Do this and you're going to go to hell. That's just not his agenda. He leads us to do our own internal work. Not just to copy off his work, but to wrestle with it ourselves. Sort of like why the math teacher says, show your work. I want to see you've done the time. That you've figured it out in your bones. What the answer to this, the solution to this problem is. So I've read lots of folks with lots of different takes on this parable. There are zillions of them. But I agree. I agree with Levine that this parable can't be domesticated. We can sure try, and we do, and there's value in Luke's message of persistence in prayer. But we try to manufacture the right answers, and parables just usually don't give you one right answer. Jesus isn't trying to confound us or frustrate us. He's trying to open us up to free us from the fetters of our stereotypes within our culture, our norms, the norms that we're tied to so tightly, to make us ask challenging questions of ourselves, to get up out of our comfy chairs, sorry everyone at home, sorry everyone in the not as comfortable pews, get up out of our chairs to lean into the search for understanding. We pray for many things, don't we? And our prayers aren't always answered. I mean, it's, praying is not a neat, tidy thing. They're not always answered in ways we can understand, at least. So perhaps Jesus' way with parables better equips us to deal with this inevitability in life, that sometimes our prayers will not be answered. It's far better than an easy, facile interpretation. Just stay persistent, and everything's going to work out fine. Life isn't a neatly wrapped package with a beautiful bow on top, and nor, nor is our faith. We aren't just marionettes in a pretty puppet show, living out lives that are all predictable and all get resolved beautifully at the end of each chapter. Jesus' unresolved parables make us stand up and get involved. They shift the posture of our prayers. Our prayers aren't so straightforward. And if at the end of our wrestling with the parable we're left a bit off balance, a bit more open-ended in our questioning, then that's probably good. Maybe it'll get us up off our soapbox 
and stop us from just shouting back at our opponents or seeking vengeance or going up to the judge and saying, I'm going to give you a black eye if you don't do what I want. In our culture today, there's an awful lot of that kind of thing going on. And instead, maybe all of us need to be opened up to the idea that in the end, we all need to seek a deeper truth together. Wrestling together, that's an act of worship. Struggling together to figure out what it means to be disciples in the world today. We need to be ready to ask the right questions about what it means to love our neighbor. And maybe this parable can put us in a place, each of us, where we're willing to ask questions about the nature of justice in the world, about who gets justice and who doesn't, about how it may come easily to me because I'm a person who has a sort of position in the world. You know, I, I may get good justice. Some people may not. Indeed, we know that justice is sometimes hard to come by. So maybe those are the kinds of questions that need to be stirred in up, up in us. And so our posture of prayer needs to be a bit more like this widow's posture, this feisty, difficult, persistent widow, kind of troubling soul, who nevertheless does not remain seated, praying quietly for others, but instead gets up and goes out into the world to effect what she believes is necessary. Our posture of prayer is not just quiet, although there's a place for that. There's a major place for that. But ultimately, we need to be those who will take our prayers out into the world, ready to be God's people seeking justice, which is what we understand Jesus calls us to yearn for and work for. May we be those who perhaps don't get folks' phone numbers and leave incessant messages on their answering machines to use an out-of-date term on their voicemails. Perhaps not choosing the methods of this persistent widow, but may we all be those who yearn for justice in the world God created, the world God loves, and will get up and with all the passion we can muster, go out to work for it. That too is worship. That too is prayer. May God bless us as we seek to bring the world God loves into the justice, the peace, the wholeness that is God's will for us all. Amen. Faithful God, as we come to prayer, Help us to remember that we do not have to beg you in order to seek good things for this world, nor find ways to persuade you to come near and listen to us. Help us remember that as we pray, we kneel in your presence alongside Jesus Christ with the help of the Holy Spirit. We bring to you those people who are in need of our prayers, those who are ill or anxious, those who are lonely or sad, those who are despairing or defeated, those who are hungry or homeless, those whose relationships are breaking apart, those who are bullied or abused, those who cannot find work, and those who are overworked. In silence now, we offer our own specific prayers for those on our hearts and minds today. In your presence, God, alongside Jesus Christ, with the help from your Holy Spirit, may we remember to pray continually, to act faithfully, and to trust that you will hear and answer us. 
Amen. Friends, now it's our time to smile. 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says that God loves a cheerful giver. So we join in God's mission in several different ways, including with our financial giving. There are several ways to give. If you prefer to give online, we have a QR code on the back of each pew to make it easy for you to find the links. If you prefer to give in person, you can drop off your gift in the baskets as you come for communion or as you exit through the main doors. We're blessed to be reminded once again of what our giving accomplishes in God's kingdom and how it makes a difference. Let's watch this video. Hi there, my name is Sean Gilliam and I'm one of the many staff members here at Clarendon United Methodist Church. And I wanna take the time right now just to say thank you. Your giving is an investment. It's an investment into other people's lives. Your giving allows Clarendon UMC to have the ministries it does so that kids, students, and adults can find and follow Jesus. Some people wonder, what difference is my contribution making? So let me tell you, because of your generosity, our student ministry is thriving. We're able to teach not only in our youth music programs, but to come together weekly for the life-giving discussions to become better people and Christ followers. We're also able to resource our students and equip them for their life's faith journey. Because of your generosity, they're finding community, investing in relationships, and connecting to each other and their leaders. Because of your generosity, our kids' ministry also has the resources to teach and minister one-of-a-kind lessons both in person and online. We're able to provide a digital curriculum each week. That means they're learning about a God who loves them, and they're forming a relationship with Jesus that will last a lifetime. Because of your generosity, our ministry teams are able to create spaces for devotions, prayer teams, and life groups. These resources allow people to connect with each other, with the church, and with God. And because of your generosity, we're able to stream and record our services. That allows us to have a reach locally, nation, and worldwide. And because of your generosity, Clarendon UMC has given thousands of dollars to local and global partners. Together, we're able to house, clothe, feed, and enrich other people's lives, all in the name of Jesus. All of this is by your giving. You're not only following the teachings of Jesus Christ, you're helping other people to find and to follow him. So, thank you. Thank you for your generosity and for investing in changed lives. You're making an investment that's going to make the difference for both now and eternity. God bless you as you give. you as the anthem and we promised that we'd be bringing it back a few weeks later and giving you an opportunity to sing it as well so we're going to close our worship service today with jesus we love you sean will sing the first verse by himself so that you get a feel again for how it goes and then i'll indicate when we'll join in and you may sing the rest of the song with us and we'll offer it as our prayer to jesus would you please stand as we sing jesus we love you passed away your love has stayed the same your constant grace remains the cornerstone things that we thought were dead breathing in life again you cause your sun to shine the darkest nights and all that you've done we will pour out our love this will be our anthem song Jesus 
forth in peace, to love, to serve the Lord, to persist in prayer. Go and may God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you and keep you now and evermore. Amen. Amen.